So I want to talk about the indoor air quality side of things right now. And that's basically where we're going to a little bit look at today. Um, at the end of this, I am going to talk a little bit about the manual D, and there's a couple things I'm going to point out in it. But we need to talk about air quality. Now, we started to talk about this when I was talking about some duct design issues. And we started talking about how you can get really get sick with indoor air quality issues. So this PowerPoint does directly come from your Chapter 28 in Modern Refrigeration. And we basically want to identify and be able to prevent indoor air quality issues. We're going to talk a little bit about filters. We're going to talk about different indoor air quality systems. So the most important thing is that indoor air quality is measured by temperature, humidity, how much fresh air flow, we call it ventilation, the number of pollutants in the air, chemicals, and that last word should have said noise. So, I mean, we, we ha have real issues we can measure. Okay, temperature is easy. I put a thermometer in a room. Humidity is easy. We use a wet bulb thermometer or psychrometer. Fresh airflow, I know how much air I'm pulling in because I can actually measure it. Pollutants have to go to a laboratory sam sampling to figure out what the pollutants are in the air, unless it's just carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. I can measure those. Chemicals in the air, you'll see the term VOCs, volatile organic compounds. You'll see that terminology. So chemicals in the air, again, are relatively easy to measure. Um, and then, of course, there's things like radon and stuff like that that we'll talk about. There's some ASHRAE standards for indoor air quality. Now, if you are ever taking a state licensing exam in a neighboring state, um, for example, I know Maryland has a licensing exam. Of course, Connecticut and Massachusetts have some licensing exam. You will need to know what standards are required for indoor air quality. Okay, ASHRAE standard 62 talks about equipment and system requirements, talks about minimal ventilation rates. ASHRAE standard 62.1 is ventilation rates based on the number of occupants in a given space. So those are two standards you do you would need to know. Again, Pennsylvania doesn't have a state licensing program, but your neighboring states do, and Maryland's is actually very along the same lines as what we wrote this curriculum originally for, which was Connecticut. So they use the same test, basically. So again, if you get licensed in Maryland, know the standard numbers. You'll have to have to understand what's in them for the test, but you just have to know what the number is. The most efficient method of relieving IAQ problems is to identify the source of the pollutants and reduce them at their source. In other words, if you have a carbon monoxide problem, you go find the source. If you have, a, if you have an organic compound problem, you go find the source. Although increasing ventilation can often improve indoor air quality, doing so increases energy usage. Remember I talked about the other, that the other day. If I pull in more air, to break up and to dilute the pollution. My energy costs are going to go way up. And that's why we have a lot of buildings that don't have good air quality because A, they have an air quality issue coming in someplace, and B, the landlords and the building management wants to keep the energy cost down as much as possible. So they basically cut down indoor air. So limiting the number of pollutants in the air improves indoor air quality without increasing energy consumption. Now, the reality is you cannot limit what people are breathing out. Okay, If you have people in a building, we're putting carbon dioxide into the air at all times. Anytime you're running electronics, any heavy electrical usage, you're putting some pollutants into the air. Okay, So it doesn't always work that way. That's why we have to have minimum ventilation rates. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and OSHA both has permissible exposure levels for the hazardous substances. Okay, so again, there is actual laws surrounding exposure rates. So a pollutant is defined as any substance that's detrimental to comfort, 
health, and desirable environment. The Federal Clean Air Act of 1970 sets some basic levels of the air you can breathe in. Our common indoor pollutants, believe it or not, is still asbestos. Then you have the bioaerosols and you have radon. Radon is more found in residential construction. Okay, but asbestos is very still commonly found in commercial construction. And asbestos is still legal to have in a building. You can't put it in new buildings, but it's still legal to have in a building unless it is broken. The minute you break the asbestos, in other words, it starts disintegrating or you start chipping on off pipes, that's where it becomes airborne and can get in your lungs. Okay, bioaerosol sprays and other such substances, again, they're very common indoor pollutants. Solid pollutants are particles suspended by air current. Could be dust, could be fumes, could be smoke. Again, bioaerosols and asbestos. Okay, they're solids. And there's some examples over here, okay, 10 plus microns, some atmospheric dust, ash, and it's particles that you can see. Okay, 5 to 10 microns, smaller. Okay, it's average atmospheric dust, pollen and mold spores. Then you start getting to the 1 to 5 microns, you have light atmospheric dust, bacteria, and pollen. And then 0.3 to 1 micron, oil fumes. Okay, that could include diesel exhaust and smoke, bacteria, suspended dust particles. So when we're talking filter sizes, where this is all going, is we're worried about being able to filter this type of micron level, this type of size of pollutants out of your airstream. Any questions on this so far? Okay, bioaerosols is something that's becoming more and more important and you know what, again, this conversation is fitting for today's day and time. Okay, bioaerosols are bacteria and mold, okay, basically, that have, that have become airborne, okay. They're, they breed in some types of humidifiers. I don't know if any of you folks have a humidifier on the side of a furnace that has a drum in it. The drum rotates and the air blows across it. Okay, so you always have a water basin in there that is full of water. The water gets replenished as the water evaporates off that rotating pad. Okay, those are very big breeding grounds for bacteria and mold. They need to be treated, they need to be cleaned regularly, and the average person doesn't clean them. They sit down there for years and years and years and build up the slime. Water spray systems. What a water spray system is, we actually spray water into the airstream to provide humidif humidifications. Okay, that actually can build up um, bacteria and mold in the ductwork. Any wet, porous surface that air blows across is a breeding ground for bacteria and mold. Okay, and this is where Legionnaire's disease comes from. Okay, Legionnaire's disease um, was based on a water spray system and a wet, porous surface. That's what started it. No one was sterilizing that equipment. Easy to control. Okay, one teaspoon of chlorine bleach per one quart of water. The other way to control it is to use a very high water heater temperature, at least 140 degrees, to control the Legionella bacteria. Now, the interesting part about it is, does anybody know what the maximum water temperature you're allowed to set a domestic hot water heater for? I think it might be 120 or yeah, it's about, I think you said 130, you broke up a little bit, but it's, it's actually like 130 to 135 in some jurisdictions. So it's really strange that the maximum you're allowed to set it at, because they're worried about kids getting burnt, is under the temperature required to control Legionella disease. Yeah, so, some, some mixing valves, that's kind of valve, valve. Yep, you can put mixing valve on it, or you can realize that everybody in your, in your household is not going to burn themselves. I mean, honestly, when I've installed hot water heaters in the past, if the mixing some areas you can't use mixing valves in, but I've basically told people, hey, I have to set this dial to 135 degrees. It's all I'm allowed to do. Leave it there through the inspector. But when I leave, I don't know what you did, and I would probably set this up to about 140. 
So, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that it's just interesting that code requirements for safety are actually under the temperatures required for Legionella. Now, the other thing we have to realize is water temperatures, hot water heaters, the water doesn't sit in there forever. Most people use a water heater pretty constantly or at least every day. So that's just something to keep in mind. I know mine set about 145 is what I keep mine set at. Asbestos is a naturally occurring mineral that forms fiber bundles. Okay, it's known for strength and fire resistance. Basically, we use it most for fire resistance. Okay, it's very important to realize asbestos in a building is not a cause for alarm until it starts breaking up. In other words, you can have asbestos floor tiles, and until those floor tiles start chipping or you start chipping them up to put in ductwork or grills or something like that, you're, you're fine because the asbestos is in the tile, it's sealed, and it isn't going to be airborne. Now, asbestos exposure came from mining, okay, then manufacturing, specifically brake linings, was the biggest issue in manufacturing. New Jersey had a tremendous asbestos problem, even airborne, because of a couple brake lining facilities. They were making brake linings for tractor trailers. Out, I think it was right around, um, oh, I forget, Jersey City, someplace in that area. And they had a big, major cleanup there in the late 80s. Um, installation of asbestos, because, again, it's airborne. You're cutting it. And more importantly, recently, removal of asbestos. If you ever come across asbestos, and it's going to be a white, fibrous insulation on the outside of heating lines, usually water pipes, if you ever come across asbestos as part of an installation job where you're removing an old system and putting in a new one, you can't do it yourself unless you're very specifically licensed and trained for it. Um, and it's something to take pretty seriously because something you do in your mid-20s working with asbestos because you think, oh, I can do this, it's easy, is really going to affect you when you're in the, your late 60s. Okay, I mean, it's it's a pretty serious issue. So. The law is, and OSHA rules are, that if you come across asbestos that has to be removed, modified, or cut, you have to call a remediation company that specifically will seal off the area, put it into a negative pressure, and do a full asbestos cleanup to get rid of the asbestos in the area you're working in. And that can become very expensive. So a lot of contractors, oh, we'll just take care of this. It's just a little bit. Well, be careful about that because, A, it's against the law, and, B, you don't want to be breathing the, that stuff in. I still come back to what I've said a couple times, that if a contractor is going to tell you to do something that's, A, illegal, and, B, is bad for your health, you need to find another place to work. That's just, again, my opinion. Okay, asbestos is a carcinogen. It's a cancer-causing agent. Breathing asbestos can cause serious lung diseases, and removal of asbestos should be done only by professional asbestos abatement companies. Again, it cannot just be done by the contractors, or more importantly, the contractor's employees. We have gaseous pollutants, too, okay? These are some of these you know, some of these you don't know. Okay, sulfur dioxide. Carbon monoxide, that comes from unburnt fuel. Okay, again, carbon monoxide is a product of unburnt fuel. Carbon dioxide, you breathe that in and out on a daily basis, okay? That's part of your respiration is carbon dioxide. You breathe it out. Too many people in a building without enough fresh air, you're going to eventually um, pass out because of the high carbon dioxide content. Okay, photochemical oxidants. Okay, this is just chemicals that we use. Nitrogen oxides, okay, NO, that's another one that you see a lot on. Chlorine, radon, paints and volatile solvents, insecticides. I'm going to tell you right now that in parts of the country, like especially like where I'm at, insecticides is a big indoor air quality issue. Come to think of it, it says outdoor air quality issue as well. Um, Radon, up in the northeast part of the country, especially the older houses with basements, becomes a big problem. Um, paints is a problem in any new construction or remodeled constructions. Paints and 
a lot of the material, a lot of the manufactured material you put in a house will do what we call off gas. In other words, they're putting out these volatile organic compounds. They're, you, that's what you're smelling in the air. They're put it out for, can be months. I did have a the, that, What? Uh, they say with paints that the VOCs can leave off supposed to forever. forever. Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, do you know if I say the word half-life? Right, okay. It sort of goes along that. Now, there's ways to, there's ways to mitigate that. Um, in two states that I know of, all new construction, once they're done with the build, before they issue the CO2s, they actually heat the inside of the houses using the heating system to about 100 degrees, as close to 100 degrees as they can get. And it's done for a 48-hour period. Wow. And that will actually help that off-gassing happen faster. It helps it reach its half-life much faster. And then they ventilate. Yeah, because I was having a conversation with somebody about it. And I said, now with the low VOC paint, most of them are labeled able to be low. Really, the only time of concern is when they're wet, mostly. Beyond that, you know, I feel like it's at a low enough standard where it's pretty safe these days. I think they're trying to make everything safer. I think they're, you're still going to you're you're still going to come across people that are very. I know of two two or three people that I've come across that are very allergic to any of it. And again, that's where I came up with the. Uh, I did some research. I talked to a bunch of people in the in the actual paint industry, and they told me about heating that house. They told me about heating the houses to about 100 degrees for 48 hours. Yeah, that's cool. And, I what? Yeah, that's cool. I I had never heard about that. Yeah, apparently heat causes it to off gas much faster. Now, again, if you heat a house to 100 degrees, you really have to be very careful. And um, I know, I think it's in um, Minnesota or one of those areas, and I know a couple areas in Canada as well. They actually make the contractor have someone on site the entire time they're doing that. Oh, lucky guy. Yeah, well, they're not in the building, but they're on site in case there's a fire. Right. So insecticides, we can suck those in through outdoor air intakes, okay? I mean, you have a lawn guy that comes around or a, or a building maintenance guy or even the exterminator. They spray, they spray the insecticides all over the place. Could be in a mechanical room, could be on a roof, could be alongside of a building. Um, in my area, I have the crop dusters that fly over the orange groves nearby. I mean, we're sucking that stuff into our out indoor air intakes, the outdoor air intakes. And that can really cause some problems. Chlorine is a big problem in hotels and facilities with indoor pools. Okay, the chlorine can actually really do a lot of damage to the inside of ductwork. Um, sheet metal ductwork will just disintegrate over probably a five, six-year period with chlorine. Um, radon, I think we talk more about it later in this chapter. So the gaseous pollutants, I believe, if you take a look at all the pollutants that are available other than the bioaerosols, the gaseous pollutants are actually the biggest risk to our indoor environment. But carbon monoxide, it's a deadly poison. You guys have all heard about the carbon monoxide issues, okay? Odorless color gas, it replaces oxygen in your red blood cells. It's incomplete combustion of fuel, automobile exhaust and fuel for burning furnaces. If you have a clean running furnace that's that isn't being overfed with gas and is burning everything the way it's supposed to be, you won't have carbon monoxide. Okay, you've heard of ventless fireplaces occasionally. You see where you can, oh, this fireplace doesn't need a chimney, it's ventless. Okay, yeah, that's great as long as you have perfect combustion. Um, there was a case about, now it's almost about 10 years ago, where one of these fireplace manufacturers had actually distributed a line of really, really nice ventless fireplaces. They were working perfectly. And what they did, they had a problem with people not registering them. Okay, you know that you get that stupid little warranty registration card in with everything, and no one ever sends those things in. So they said to the homeowners, 
when you send this card in, we're going to send you a set of decorative pine cones that you can put on top of the fake logs in the, in the fireplace. Yeah, neat. So people were sending these cards in. They were sending the homeowner back a package with two pine cones that actually glowed when you put them in the right place and a very specific direction on how to place these things on the log. It included pictures and everything else like that. Well, pe people's carbon monoxide alarms started going off and the Chicago Fire Department is actually the one that figured out what was going on. Um, people were not reading the directions. So they were tossing these logs right on top, they were tossing these pine cones right on top of the logs in their fireplaces. And because they weren't being placed properly, it affected the combustion of the fuel. So the ventless fireplace that was not producing any carbon monoxide when it was installed by the installation company, all of a sudden was producing carbon monoxide because of these pine cones that were being sent out by the manufacturer with directions. Well, people don't read directions. We all know that. And they were actually causing a carbon monoxide problem. Um, City of Chicago immediately outlawed any ventless fireplaces, and that spread across. I think there's a couple other states now across the northern part of the country that don't allow any ventless fireplaces to this day because of that issue. But um, carbon monoxide exposure, you know what? If you have carbon monoxide, I probably wouldn't want to be in this space at all. Parts per million, between 200 and 400, it's like headache. 1,000 to 2,000, you're going to start having heart issues. And then um, based on time, you'll start staggering around and you'll have mental confusion. 2,000 to 2,500 unconsciousness within 30 minutes. Upwards of 2,500 parts per million, eh, death. Now, what they're not listing here is the, these are the immediate effects, okay? These are called short-term effects. What they're not showing on this is the long-term ter effects. Now, our carbon monoxide alarms, the one you have in your houses, on your ceilings, they only go off at 100 parts per million, okay? So what, are, what happens when we have carbon monoxide in the air under 100 parts per million? Actually, there's several long-term health effects. Um, there's, they've done studies on um, Alzheimer's actually increases if you have long-term effects of carbon monoxide, which is actually interesting if you look at some of our elderly population. They've been, a lot of them have been cooking with gas ovens for years, um, didn't know a lot about, we didn't really worry about indoor air quality back then. So there is there's a little bit of a connection that they've done some studies on that. On um, ADD, ADHD, they have found the rates increase if there's been a long-term low-level carbon monoxide. There's again been studies done on that. So it's the long-term low-level effects can also be health problems. Of course, everyone lists the high-level effects. But what happens if we have someone in a building with it for five, six years, if it's just 50 parts per million. There's effects there as well. There's health effects. What about, um, say, like a, a cigarette smoker? Um, cigarette smoke produces carbon monoxide. So, like, um, is the parts per million produced by that? It, is, is it um, any dangerous, say, having a furnace that is not burning correctly? You know, it's, it's actually interesting you bring that up. Um, I went to a class on carbon monoxide because I'm certified in indoor environmental specialties. But I went to a class on carbon monoxide. I want to say now it's about 15 years ago. And the guy who taught the class was an extremely heavy smoker. I mean, we had a smoke break probably every 15 minutes. Okay. And I asked him about it. I said, here you're teaching a carbon monoxide class. And you are the heaviest smoker I've ever seen. I said, isn't that sort of contradictory? And he says, yeah, but he says, over time, my tolerance to carbon monoxide has increased because he's always breathing it out. It's, it's something that your body apparently adjusts to over time. So he has a much higher tolerance. Now, does he have other lung issues because of the tar and stuff like that? Probably. 
Um, but I ran into somebody, I ran into his boss at the conference probably, oh, it was the AHR conference here in Orlando just a couple, just about a month and a half ago, right before I came up north to see you guys. And um, he, his boss was there. I said, hey, is Charlie still working for you? Oh, yeah, still going strong. I said, is he still smoking? Oh, yeah, never puts the thing down. Always smoking. So, um, obviously, it's not killing him. At least that isn't. So, But apparently the tolerance goes up for people who are cigarette smokers. So, carbon dioxide, okay, is a non-toxic combination of carbon and oxygen. Now, let's be careful about that word non-toxic because high concentrations can indicate buildup of more harmful things like other gases, bacteria, and viruses. Okay, carbon dioxide is only found in high concentrations if the building does not have a proper ventilation system. Okay, in areas of poor ventilations, fatigue, headaches, general discomfort. If you are in a building, office building, where people are always tired, where there's a lot of colds, bacteria, and other flu-like symptoms going around, it is most likely, and if it's chronic, in other words, if it's not just a single outbreak and people move on, if it's chronic for a building, it means there's not enough ventilation. Okay, and I can measure the indoor health of a building by taking a carbon dioxide reading. Okay, you can take a meter in, almost like my Testo Smart Probe kit, it's a small little tool, hold it up in the air in different places in the building, and I can tell you the health of the building by taking a carbon dioxide reading. Okay? Now, ozone, in small amounts, is a disinfectant. It can remove odors, and it can sterilize. Hotels use ozone generators to sterilize rooms. Okay, every, they're supposed to be doing it about once every other month to every single room. But ozone generators are, in small amounts, they're disinfectant, but you don't want to put large amounts into a space where people are in. It can cause chest pain, coughing, throat irritation, congestion, and can worsen current respiratory. Okay, so ozone is one that we also worry about in large quantities. Okay, in several, several areas, in hospitals especially, we have ozone sensors in the ductwork. So we know if an area is getting too high in ozone and we can ventilate the space to put some to get that level down. Radon. Okay, you cannot do a real estate transaction with a house with a basement without testing for radon. It's odorless, tasteless, and it's radioactive. It's formed from the natural decay of uranium and it's found in some industrial waste. It causes lung cancers. It enters your buildings from cracks in concrete floors, around drains, and in sump pump wells. Again, detectors are available. But nine out of ten times, if you do a real estate transaction, someone's going to come in and put a radon test kit in your basement. They're going to take it out a couple days later. They're going to send it off to the lab and tell you if there's a radon problem or not. If there's a radon problem, it gets fixed, okay? What they basically do, well, this shows how it comes in, okay? Radon's released from the soil, enters a basement area, and gets blown around a house through ductwork. But what they can actually do is they put in a vent that starts under your house in a gravel pit that they build and goes out through the ceiling. That vent runs 24 hours a day. There's a little fan in it. And what it does, it actually pulls the radon out of the soil under the house. But radon is something very important because, again, that is a cancer-causing issue. Volatile organic compounds. Okay, this is the ones we're talking about, like paint, pesticides, furnishing, cleaning and disinfecting supplies, office equipment. It's a variety of chemicals, short and long-term health effects. Okay, it's used in a lot of household products. These can actually cause a lot of issues. 
but these are fixable. Again, they'll off-gas over time. It's sort of like a half-life situation, like you hear about a lot of the nuclear stuff has a half-life of however many years, but you can speed that up with heat. So whatever we have in here, we need to be careful of that diminished quality of indoor air. Okay, unforeseen results of improved building standards. Okay, improved building standards, energy efficiency code. For a long time, they were saying seal the houses as tight as you can possibly seal them. Put, put foam insulation around everything. Put um, these gaskets on windows. Okay, get, your, get as little outside air as you can possibly can. Well, we had health issues that came from it. All of a sudden, there was a ton of carbon monoxide calls. There was a lot of people getting seriously sick over this. So now they're saying that you have to have uh, building air changes of three to seven times per hour. Okay, in other words, the air has to be able to circulate in and out of your house between three and seven times per hour in ventilation. We, they have reduced the infiltration. We have a lot of vapors released from these newer building materials. Okay, great, you put a pergo floor in, it saves money and looks nicer sometimes longer with less maintenance than a wood floor, but there's a lot of vapors released. Okay, we use these kiln dried um, and all these pieces of lumber, like the blue lumber that prevents mold, the pink lumber that prevents fire. All of this stuff has a lot of extra chemicals in it. We're releasing those chemicals into the air. So if you have building-related symptoms like constant headaches, fatigue, eye, nose, and throat irritation, confusion, dizziness, and skin rashes, all of this stuff could have to do with indoor air quality. Okay? And you can right away tell because if you leave the building for a couple days, some of these things will start to clear up almost immediately. Okay, I've gotten a couple service calls from people and a couple environmental calls that I've done over the years where people say, hey, you know, we didn't think anything about it, but we were feeling sick while we were in our house, and this has been what's going on. But we went on vacation to, let's say, Cape Cod or to the beach someplace, and all of a sudden these symptoms went away. We came back, we thought it was vacation. Hey, we needed a break cleared up, we came back home and all of this started again. You know, that tells me that it's in the building and you start looking harder. Um, in Back in probably 2002, I was in Massachusetts doing service work and a lady had a daycare and all the kids were getting sick in her daycare. She called in, it's like she was at, didn't know what was going on. Well, it turned out the oil furnace exhaust was right next to the fresh air intake for their ventilator. So it was sort of recycling the oil furnace exhaust back into the house. Small problem. Primary causes of poor IAQ, and this is the stuff I really want you to think about and look at when you do today's labs and discussion boards. Okay, decreased fresh air infiltration. Fumes and VOCs released from building materials. Moisture infiltration. If I have moisture coming in a house, and if it's getting my building materials like insulation, sheetrock, any flooring damp, I'm going to have mold. Occupant habits are a source of indoor air quality. If you have a smoker, you might have to get some more ventilation and some extra filters in there. Lack of home and HVAC maintenance. Okay. If the house and the building is not properly maintained, I see this a lot on apartment buildings and rental homes, okay? If it's not maintained because it's the landlord's responsibility, they're not doing it, and the homeowner obviously doesn't want to put out the money if the landlord's supposed to be doing it or the renter doesn't put out the money, okay? Someone has to maintain the HVAC system. Someone has to maintain the house. And if that's not being maintained properly, you can have real indoor air quality issues. And 9 out of 10 times, they, re they come around the mold issues, mold and bacteria. So again, primary causes. The last one here, if I get it, I, do a, I told you guys before, I do a lot of insurance investigations as side work. Okay, insurance companies call me out to look at HVAC systems. If I find a maintenance problem, it's grounds for a claim not being paid. 
Indications of indoor air quality problems, this is just a checklist. This is in your handouts for today. Okay, I have this checklist and I may, I'll try to find the, my original file on it, so I'll, if I can, I'll upload it. But this is just a checklist that I even use to this day. Your, your book publisher is the one who I think came up with it, or a, Air Quality Sciences or something did. But it's a checklist that ever, anybody can go through and say, okay, here are the causes of my indoor air quality. Okay, for example, it was the building constructed or remodeled recently. Why am I asking that question? What, what, what is my indoor air quality issue for re recently constructed or remodeled? Anybody? Change the pressure of the house? Well, there, yeah, pressures is an issue, but there was a, but there was a specific pollutant that I was talking about that has to do with recent, recently constructed or remodeled. We'd be worried about carbon. I'd be worried about the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. Okay, air fresheners, deodorizers, wood furniture, paneling. Okay, I'm worried about uh, VOC, scented candles. Okay, all of these four items is volatile organic compounds. Febreze, that, that um, deodorizer is not as innocent as they make it out to be. It has a lot of VOCs in it. Um, musty odors present. Okay, musty odors. Okay, all of that stuff has to do with outdoor air and damp. If it smells musty, I got mold someplace. I have dampness someplace. Um, mothballs is a major issue. People do not realize that the scent that mothballs put off is, a, is an insecticide. Okay, it's a very dangerous stuff. People don't realize that. So it's just all of this stuff is... Um, is important to keep in mind when you're looking at indoor air quality. And some place along the way as part of your career, you're going to have a customer that says something about wanting to know what's going on, and I, I just want this to come to mind. And for those of you who really understand airflow, air pressures, and building construction, the indoor air quality side of the HVAC trade, and it is our responsibility, is really, really growing. There's more and more people out there who've decided to become experts in indoor air quality. And that is an awesome side of the trade. It's probably one of the ones where you can actually make the most difference to somebody on a long-term basis. So when we talk about high-risk individuals, children younger than four years old are very susceptible to indoor air quality issues, specifically the VOCs and the carbon monoxide. Same with people older than 60 years old. If you're in your house for more than 12 hours per day, again, current situation for a lot of people, okay, you're susceptible to indoor air quality issues. People undergoing chemotherapy and people with compromised immune systems are very susceptible. People with asthma, allergies, bronchitis, emphysema, or heart conditions, again, because your breathing really, really matters. Okay, they're very susceptible to indoor air quality issues. Okay, and compromised immune systems can be drug-induced as well. Certain um, long-term drugs people are on in terms of like blood thinners, um, cholesterol meds can actually compromise your immune system and make you more susceptible. So when I walk up and do a residential inspection, okay, First thing I do is walk around the house. I want to take a look around the outside of the house. I'm looking for cracks. I'm looking for moisture sitting. I'm looking for sources of herbicides, pollen, dust, pesticides. Okay? I take a look at the outside and the inside of the garage. I want to look for paints and solvents. I want to take a look at is the opening in the garage ceiling where there's an attic, is it connected to the main house attic? Okay? Because, again, you can actually have this stuff that just flows with air pressures and air currents. Is there gasoline being stored in the garage? Well, gasoline is a pretty heavy off-gassing. 
Okay, and it's not just the oil base of the gasoline that can cause problems. It's some of the added chemicals that are added to gasoline that's a problem. Okay, mold and mildew in a garage can actually get into the main house. Why? Because you open this garage door, okay, all of a sudden I have a sudden rush of air, and if this house is in a negative pressure, that outside air is going to start causing currents and pull into the main house. Okay, so you have to have that, um, that, hang on one sec, guys. Okay, someone else got it. Okay, you have to have that, um, the break, the air barriers between garages and the indoor house. I take a look around chimneys. Okay, around the chimneys is an area where we have a lot of cracks and crevices. If you look at the side of a house where there's fireplace and the chimney, you can see all the way up the side of the house. All along there is a source for water. It has to be sealed. So when I look at the outside of the house, that's what I look at. Then you go inside. Okay, is the attic, does it have asbestos insulation in it? If it's in a very old house, it's very possible. Well, that insulation blows around when there's wind. It's part of the attic ventilation. That asbestos will move. Okay, it's not a good idea. Formaldehyde. There was a lot of insulation that was actually manufactured back in the 1970s and early 1980s that had formaldehyde right in it. Okay, so the formaldehyde is something that if, again, we'll get into the house from the attic, air pressures. All of a sudden, if my house is um, warmer than the attic, the air currents will start moving. Cold air will fall along with any formaldehyde or anything in the attic. If my ductwork has a leak, specifically the return ducts, if I can see leaks and missing insulation and missing seals on the ductwork joints, it's pulling it into the house. Okay? Uh, bathrooms. When I glance around again, when I do an indoor air quality inspection, I walk that entire house, okay? I have very little pity on anything that I find around the house. People always apologize it's messy or whatever. You know what? That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for mold, mildew. I'm looking for cleaning agents, okay? A lot of people spray a lot of very heavy air fresheners and stuff to overcome mold and mildew and lack of ventilation, okay? Living areas, okay? Carpet, new carpet is a dead giveaway. New carpet is very heavy with VOCs. Carpet is probably the top source of VOCs in a house. That smell of the new carpet smell is actually chemicals people are breathing in. Um, glues, varnishes, pet dander, some people are very allergic to. Some are not. Any questions on what on this slide here? What about like, um, for example, um, kitchen vents or bathroom vents? Are those also like sources that for things that can go wrong? If they're not working properly, okay, bathroom exhaust fans have to be sized properly, and kitchen exhaust fans, again, have to be sized properly. Now, if you have one of those, if you are in a situation where you have a home or go into a home that has the big commercial kitchen appliances, okay, where someone went all out on a kitchen remodel, Okay, that kitchen exhaust fan can actually put the house into a negative pressure within one minute of operation. So if you have a big kitchen exhaust fan, the first thing I am looking for is to make sure there's makeup air someplace. And it, because if it's a gas burning or an oil burning, burn, burning furnace in that house, that kitchen exhaust fan runs, that furnace is going to vent the wrong direction and pull all the fumes back into the house. Bathroom exhaust fans, I worry about that they're working, okay, because they're not, they're usually smaller, but, and I'll probably take some pictures of it later and get it, try to get it up into one of the discussion boards, but they have to work for the entire space, okay? If you have an enclosed shower, okay, and if the shower doesn't have any exhaust fan at the ceiling, you're going to have a tendency to start building up moisture on the ceiling of the shower that the exhaust fan can't even get to because the moisture is just going to go up. 
So, yeah, bathroom and kitchen exhaust fans I do worry about. One, because it might not be installed in the right location, and two, because it might pull out too much air too fast. Any other questions on this or any other questions you have on what I'm looking for in a house? Okay. So res categories of IAQ complaints, you have ventilation-related re complaints. You have source-related complaints. You have chemical or biological hypersensitivity, and you have perceived IAQ problems. Okay, those are all types of different complaints we get. Commercial is very similar to residential, okay? Very similar, but... Again, we want to find com complaint patterns. In a big commercial building, one floor may have more complaints than another floor. We take a look at the HVAC systems. We determine pollutant sources, we test air pollutants, and we make recommendations. That's how we do commercial IAQ assessments. You are, as a first, second, third year technician, you should never be sent on an IAQ assessment before you do a bunch of them with somebody else. Because there's a way to assess a building and assess a home for IAQ problems without scaring the crap out of the residents. Okay, so you, it's a very touchy thing. You have, to, you have to find the problem, but you don't want to make the people immediately feel, oh my God, I gotta run to the emergency room, I'm gonna die. Okay, that's, that's not why we do IAQ assessments. I know of one local company that's, that actually um, goes through, there's, a, there's an over 65 um, village close to me and they go through this housing development at least once a year and they sell everybody new ultraviolet lights because they're going to die of something. Well, I mean, that's, that's just, it's, it's not the right way to do, it's not the right thing to do. So, again, this, this chart is in your handouts, okay? There's IAQ problems and there's solutions. Okay, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, the symptoms, respiratory difficulties, and allergies. Okay, ideal levels, as low as possible. Solution is basically ventilation. And you can do an air purifier. I'm not crazy about those. Solutions is basically ventilation. Bioaerosols and other airborne policies. Filters. And you can use a UV light, a germicidal light on the evaporator coil, and those really work. I like those. And I think I have a picture of that that I'll be showing you. Humidity issues. It's discomfort. Increased fungal, fungal growth. Okay, so you want to be between 25 and 55% humidity. Now, ideally under 50. That 55 is a little bit higher, but in some parts of the country, in the summer months, that's all we can get. I rarely get my house in peak summer months down below 55% humidity, and I have properly installed systems and everything. It's just almost impossible. Okay, humidifiers and dehumidifiers. Under 25%, people get really discomfort, dry skin, dry nose. It's a, it's a big discomfort issue. If, you're people, if you have a customer on oxygen, especially elderly, people with lung issues on oxygen, they gotta have that higher humidity. Temperature between 68 and 81 degrees. Okay, if you have temperature issues, it's either the the equipment is just not working properly, but a lot of times it's just installing a better thermostat. There's a lot of people out there who still have the little non-digital round thermostats, the one with the mercury bulbs in it. Those things haven't been sold on the market since probably 19, well, 2000, I think, is when they stopped really selling the, the mercury ones. Well, if the thing's that old, it's probably time to be replaced. The one thing I will give you a warning on this, if you sell someone a better thermostat, make sure that they will be able to operate it, okay? A um, company that I worked for for a while had a, had a um, contest going on that it, it had to be a 
an upgrade. In other words, you they didn't allow the technicians just to do this just to if the thermostat wasn't working or they got a service call because of a broken thermostat. But if you upgraded a customer to a more efficient, um, programmable thermostat, the technician got a $10 gift certificate. Okay, well, and that went up based on the level of thermostat. Well, we had a technician who was an ec who was excellent at this. Never did the wrong thing for the customer, but was really great at um, getting selling the top end thermostat, and did it honestly too. But wasn't very good at telling the type of customer. So he sold. I called it the enterprise of the thermostat. It was probably one of the highest end digital thermostats, programmable, sixteen thousand settings, and everything else like that. He sold that to somebody in their 80s, okay, where she had been used to just a turn it on and off twist thermostat on her wall. Well, every year he got to go back, and I think to this day he's still there, and twice a year he goes back to that lady's house and reprograms that thermostat for um, either summer or winter operation because she could not program that thermostat. So again, be careful when you sell thermostat upgrades to make sure that the customer can actually operate it, because it happens. Carbon dioxide is poor ventilation, CO2. You'll feel it when you go into a building. It will, feel, it will smell like stale air. Okay, sick building syndrome is a term we use for this, okay? You have buildings where people are constantly sick, or spots in buildings where people are constantly sick. Okay, sick building syndrome. We want to make sure we are under 700 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Okay, and this is measurable. Okay, there's sensors and stuff that we put in commercial buildings that automatically ventilate a building when we get close to that 700 parts per million. Install a heat recovery ventilator, install energy recovery ventilators, and replace the filters regularly because that can affect ventilation. Carbon monoxide, you can't have any of it. Okay, the ideal level, zero parts per million. It can cause illness and death. Repair the furnace or gas appliances. Do not operate vehicles or gas-powered equipment in an attached garage and install a CO detector. Um, had, a, had a customer back um, probably in 2006 or something like that, right before I start, came to Porter and Chester, um, that actually her carbon monoxide alarm went off regularly about 6.30 in the morning. Okay, we, for a long time, we were sending technicians out there for, to try to figure out why at 6.30 in the morning her carbon monoxide detector on the second floor of her house would go off. I mean, we, the technicians put test kits on the furnaces. We sent like six, seven technicians out there. And it was becoming a real problem because no one could figure out what was going on. And the customer was threatening legal action. Um, I, send a, I send one of our lead service techs out. This was when I was a service manager. Send one of our lead service techs out. And I told him not to go to the house. I told him to sit outside, just sit around the corner where you could see the house and see what was going on. He called me about an hour later just laughing, and he told me that the lady came out. She let her dog out by raising the garage door about two feet off the ground, and when she let her dog out, um, she started her car. Okay, didn't open, didn't open the garage door all the way, just started the car with the garage door about two foot off the ground. And then went back in the house and left the car running for about 20, 25 minutes while she got ready for work. She then brought the dog in and then eventually went to work. Okay, so all that time the car was running in the garage with the garage door up about two feet, the air wasn't going out of the garage. It was a stack effect that was actually pulling the air into the building. It was an attached garage. It went directly through the house up to the second floor and started building up right under the attic where the carbon monoxide alarm was. So again, it's sometimes not an equipment problem. It's sometimes a people problem. Any questions on this? Okay, 
Education plays a big role in this whole thing. Educate building occupants about causes and remedies. Emphasize the importance of regular maintenance and inspection. Encourage occupants to take a more proactive role. Provide a list of recommendations to people. Okay, it's all about education for many of these building, for many of these air quality issues. Provide adequate ventilation and filtration. Okay, use filters with a MERV rating of 13, and I'll talk more about that. That's just basically a filter rating. It tells the particulate size that it can handle. Okay, you have to have maintenance and inspection plans. Okay, that include looking at air intakes. Ventilation rooms, okay, humidity levels, again, here's a different number, again, 40 to 60, depending on what agency you look at, again, anything over 50 will grow mold. Here they give you a temperature range, 72 to 76 degrees. Ensure adequate ventilation. Make sure furnace filters are replaced on a schedule. Hey, I walked into a house about two weeks ago that I did an insurance inspection in, and I asked the homeowner, when's the last time you replaced the filter? She looked at me in the eye, and she honestly said, what filter? And it was her husband had passed away about a month before, and she had no clue she had air filters. Uh, looked like a cat died on that filter. But make sure filters filters are replaced. Eliminate unwanted drafts. If you feel a draft, there's a problem someplace. There's either too much air going on or you have a stack effect going on or something is going on. It shouldn't be happening. Okay, so again, classifications of indoor air quality issues, sick building sy syndrome, okay? Airborne chemicals and pollutants, building-related um, illnesses, Legionnaire's disease, Flu, viruses, tuberculosis, metal, smallpox, those are all building-related illnesses. And then multiple chemical sensitivity. A lot of the elderly are very sensitive to chemicals. I mean, and you can't have anything in their house. So um, when we were talking in, in refrigeration about cleaning evaporators, I know I mentioned it to part of you at least. You will always ask a customer, if they are, have any chemical sensitivities. If they have chemical sensitivities, you've got to be very, very careful on cleaning, okay? Because you could actually put a chemical on an evaporator coil that the customer is allergic to and can actually hospitalize them. You don't want to do that. So if I have a person who has any chemical sensitivities, I don't use any cleaning products other than water. Okay, air filter efficiency is measured by the total of weight of dirt collected, the size of the smallest particle that can be removed, and the degree of discoloration on the exhaust side. So again, there's small, medium, and large, and each filter that you buy, if you look at the filter labels, it will tell you is it a class E1, E2, or E3 filter. E3 filters are basically there for equipment protection. Okay, we want to protect the equipment. Once you get to E2 and E1, you're there for air quality. So filter efficiency. Now, if I put a filter in a system that has the smallest type of particles, I'm going to restrict airflow. comes back to the pressure drops we were talking about. Different filters have different pressure drops. MERV ratings, again, is a type of filter rating. Okay, so over on the left-hand column of these charts, you see the MERV rating. It tells you the size of microns. It tells you what it can be used for, okay, and it tells you what it will actually pick up, okay? MERV 1 through 4 is minimum filtration required for residential and window air, residential window air conditioners. Okay, minimum filter required. It picks up big particles. MERV 5, we start thinking about mold spores, hairspray, cement dust, and powdered milk, okay? Um, it's commercial op buildings, better residential buildings, industrial workplace, and it's a minimum allowed for paint booth inlets. MERV 9 through 12, we start talking about it will eliminate Legionella, lead dust, milled flour, coal dust, auto emission, nebulizer drops, and welding fumes. 
high-end residential. MRF through 13 through 16 hospitals. Okay, very tight filters, 0.3 to 1 micron, very tight buildings. Okay, so the higher the quality of these filters, the more expensive they are if you look at where they're being used. I mean, think about a window air conditioner. The filter in there is a little foam pad, barely filters anything. You see a lot of this type of filter also on air intakes, outdoor air intakes, where it's still going to go through a second filter, but the primary filter is going to be just a little pad or a wire pad. Questions on this? Okay, types of air filters. Okay, we have disposable, washable, electrostatic, carbon and HEPA. Okay, the HEPA filter has a fiberglass media, okay, and the air flows through little channels that could get progressively smaller. Local codes, building codes do affect types of filters you are allowed to use. It dictates the media or what the filter is made out of that can be used. It dictates the airflow requirements and it dictates flammability limits of treatment supplied to the filter. A lot of people like spray adhesives or static spray on filters to make them more efficient. You might not be allowed to do that, and I would never recommend doing that anyways, but I've seen people do it. Okay, but it becomes a fire hazard. Okay, filter maintenance is extremely important. If they get too full, they'll start allowing stuff to go through. It's called unloading. Okay, it spreads contaminants onto the system surfaces after the filter. It allows whatever you're filtering to re-enter re the conditioned spaces, and it affects heat transfer and increased energy costs. If I have a filter that's clogged, okay, I'm not getting the airflow through the furnace or the air conditioner that I need, and it's going to affect the overall system operation. The next part that's going to get clogged up with dust and dirt is going to be your blower wheel the little squirrel cage that's part of the blower wheel. You have to change filters when they reach approximately 80% of design resistance. And how do we measure this? In a commercial building, I put an air pressure sensor on each side of the filter. I can now tell how much of a pressure drop that that filter is causing. I know what it should be new. I know what it should be at 80%. And I can easily signal somebody through, a computer, through the computers, through the building climate system, to say, hey, go change the filter. In a residential environment, we set a filter change reminder on the thermostats in most residences. However, I'm starting to see sensors in the furnaces that actually sense the air pressures on each side of the filter. They're now starting to copy what they've been doing in commercial buildings for years. If the filter's torn or ripped, it should be immediately replaced. Okay, so again, measuring filter efficiencies, it's done in a lab. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It really doesn't matter, okay, because you guys are going to use the filter efficiencies that are stamped on the filter. Electronic air cleaners, okay, what they are is they're in the return duct, and they're usually about four to five inches wide. It looks like a metal box. It has a pre-filter that's normally just captures the largest dust particles, okay? It's a pre-filter. It's normally a fiberglass filter that you hold up to the light you can actually somewhat see through. Then you come into the air filter and it has, if you pull the filter open, it has blades, okay? It looks just like metal blades next to each other, okay? Those are negatively charged. What it does when the air flows through the pre-filter, it comes out and it goes across wires that create an electrostatic field that's positively charging the, these articles, these particles that are coming through. The air blows across a negatively charged plate, and you can almost hear it like a bug zapper. It captures these particles right onto these plates. Okay? has to be cleaned once in a while. The easiest way to clean these electronic filters is A, turn it off, B, take it and throw it through a dishwasher. That's how you can clean these filters easily. You let them dry before you put them back in. You put it back in and return it to operation. 
But the easiest way to clean these electronic air static plates is just to toss it through a dishwasher. Other than that, it's a garden hose outside and a little bit of scrubbing. So to clean the plates regularly, when I've had these, when I've put these in for customers, I tell them once a month, pull these two, turn this switch off, pull these out, throw it through a dishwasher with nothing else, and put it, let it dry and put it back in. And these things will last almost forever if you take care of them. If you don't take care of them, or if you don't change this pre-filter, they can actually turn into a little bit of a fire hazard. So I've seen these actually catch, I've seen a filter catch on fire if somebody uses a paper filter instead of, in a, instead of a fiberglass filter and doesn't change it, it pulls into this and the paper will actually burn. A passive electrostatic filter can be installed in the HVAC system to improve filtering capability and it doesn't really increase energy consumption. That little bit of electrostatic charge okay, can be produced also by the friction of the air blowing across the fibers in the filter. So sometimes these filters are designed for no outdoor power source. Several manufacturers produce electrostatic coating that can be sprayed into a disposable filter. Again, don't use this if code in your area says you can't spray anything on the filters. Okay, I don't like this idea, this last one, that you spray anything on a filter. People can be allergic to that stuff. I wouldn't do it. Electro electronic air cleaners, you got to be careful with them. That's why I say turn the switch off before you open them. 12,000 volts is used on those wires. If you touch that, it's going to knock you on your butt. Okay, so always turn the switch off before you open these things. They use a step-up transformer. Okay, they are dangerous if you operate them without the cover on or if you service them without turning the electrical supply off. Always double check. And most of these have a cord that plugs into a plug that you can unplug. And I just recommend don't trust the switch. Unplug the thing. If I have a choice between standing, taking an extra couple minutes to unplug something or playing around with 12,000 volts, I'm going to unplug it. Okay. Clean the unit according to recommended schedule. Excess dirt buildup can catch fire. Okay. Air purifiers. You see these advertised at least once or twice a year around the winter months. Okay. They're little standalone things that you can put in a room and ionize the air that sucks through it and it purifies the air, okay? Charged particles in incoming air can stick to surfaces around a room. In other words, it's ionizing it. It's adding electrons or removing electrons to create a negative or a positive charge. The neutralizer static charges, this neutralizes the static charges that cause dirt and dust to stick to walls and other surfaces. Some pur air purifiers produce ozone as a byproduct. Okay, so again, be careful with these things. If you use an ionizing air purifier in, for example, a baby's room that's having some respiratory issues, okay, you've got to be very careful that the thing does not produce ozone. It's very important. Now, if you look at this, okay, what it does, okay, it neutralizes charges that cause dust or dirt to stick to walls and other surfaces. Does it say anything about removing this the dust and dirt from the air from the air circulation no it really doesn't okay it neutralizes charges that make the dust and dirt visible but it's still there you have to have filtration any questions on that okay let's move on to uv lights Okay, UV lights are usually installed in two places in a system. One in the return duct, and it's usually far enough away from wherever the filter is. In this furnace, the filter is probably in a little spot right between the, on that return duct that's right between the room air duct and the blower compartment, okay? There looks like there's probably a filter that slides in from the top right there. But UV lights are usually installed in the return duct, and it's out of the picture here, but over the cooling coil, which is in the supply duct. Okay, those are the two places we install UV lights. Okay, UV is a germicidal. It destroys viruses, bacteria, and fungi. 
The effect depends on the length of exposure to UV lay, rays, the lamp intensity. They have to be cleaned quarterly, and the lights have to re be replaced every year. Okay, installation locations can vary. But for example, if you have a, a three-ton air conditioner, we're moving 1,200 CFMs of air at a speed of up to 1,000 feet per minute. This UV light doesn't have one light bulb, will not have enough contact time with that air to make a difference. That's why UV lights have to be sized based on the equipment that it's installed with. If you're just going around installing a single UV light in everyone's ductwork to say you've installed a UV light, because people are really concerned about this type of stuff right now, bacteria, viruses, and fungi, okay, it's not a good idea because one UV light for a bigger system won't work. So there are a lot of times installed multiple bulbs in two different places. The more time that that air is in contact with the UV rays, the better off we're going to be. Lamps are expensive, too, so just something to keep in mind. Any questions on UV lights? Oh, you don't want to look at these things. If you're looking at these things when you're servicing the equipment while they're running, just don't do it. You won't have eyesight after a while. Not a good idea. Avoid looking at or being exposed to UV light rays. Risk of skin and eye damage increases with the length of exposure. To verify that lights are operating, check the lamp indicator on the lamp knob. Never do look directly at the lamps while they're illuminated. And these things are supposed to shut off when the furnace is, when the air is not moving. In other words, they should not be left on all the time. It will actually break down the inside of the duct insulation as well as the pan that's underneath the evaporator coil. So these things should not be left on when the furnace is not running. They have to be wired properly to only be on when the blower runs. Okay. So the whole indoor air quality system is all of these parts we've been talking about put together. It manages temperature, manages humidity, manages cleanliness, fresh air in and stale air out. The IAQ systems helps and controls minimum for the infiltration and exfiltration. We're going to talk more about infiltration and exfiltration as we start talking about design. Okay, infiltration is basically air that comes into a building that's not controlled. That's like the air you feel coming in around doors, windows, through plugs. Exfiltration is the same thing, but it's air moving out of the building that's not controlled. Okay, so the entire HVAC system, everything having to do with HVAC, is part of the indoor air quality system. So again, HVAC techs are much more have much more responsibility than just the box that you're out there fixing. There's an overall building responsibility as well. Again, maintaining indoor air quality, stale in air indoors, exchange with fresh air outdoor air. Heat loss is reduced by using HRVs or ERVs. Heat recovery ventilator, sensible heat only. Energy recovery ventilator controls sensible and latent heat. Okay, so in areas that are very high humidity where we're air conditioning all the time, we use what's called an energy recovery ventilator. It worries about latent heat and moisture. Up in the northeast part of the country, where 90% of the time is either heating or windows open, we're using HRVs, sensible heat only. I don't have to worry about humidity that much up there. Okay, any questions on what we just went over? I have a, a question about the discussion. Okay, the, the indoor air quality discussion? Yes, sir. Okay, let me pull it up because I forget exactly how I worded it. Okay. Okay, what? go ahead and ask. Um, I was just wondering with what to do with the last part of the uh, discussion. What exactly were you looking for, like, equations? I, wa I want you guys to figure out um, how much outdoor air 
you believe your home would need based on the number of occupants? Do, uh, is there a, like a chart for that or something? Or um, yeah, it's actually it's actually in your chapter. Um, let me give you a, let me give you the page number. I went over this. The, I think I pointed it out the other day, but I let me just find it here real quick again. Um, bear with me one sec. Right. If I remember right, it was it was a. I'm trying to find it in here, but it was like 15 CFM per occupant. I don't know where I'm not finding it in the in the book right now, but it's 15 CFM per occupant, and it's a per occupant of what the house was designed for, and that's why I put that thing in there. Um, you can't really count the people because sometimes there's more people in a house that's required or less. <laughs> If you take a look at the bedrooms, the number of bedrooms, and multiply it by 1.5. Now, is that uh, 1.5 CFM per bedroom, or is that no? Uh, that's to find out your number of people. So, if you take a look at the if you take a look at the number of bedrooms, multiply them by 1.5. That's the number of people likely to reside in the home. Yeah, for a calculation online, um, it's talking about, I did a, about the cubit of the house, basically. Like the volume. Yeah, yeah you can do it that way. House. Yep. You and can do you it would... that way, too. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple different ways you can do this, which is why I didn't very specifically put that 15 CFM in there. But the way I normally do it, and again, if you've done it other ways and find other correlations, I'm perfectly fine with that. But um, one way to do it is you take the number of bedrooms times 1.5. That tells you how many people are, might be in the house. Then you multiply that by 15 CFM. You have to add some for the bathrooms and some for the kitchen. Usually 100 CFM will take care of that. And again, there's, there's not a single right answer on that, so I'm not sure if that helps you at all. Yeah, the way I did it is um, the cubic of the house um, and the time that time you want the cycle of the earth, I think it's like three minimum. Yep. And then you divide that by 60, I believe. Which is so, uh, yeah. 60 minutes, right? Yeah, 60 minutes to the hour, yep. Because your air exchanges are per hour. So, yeah, right. you divide that by 60 to come up with the minutes. I'm fine with that. That is a very accurate – that's probably the most accurate way to do it. Any other questions on this discussion? My question is more in the lab. Because my house is like a, 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 a live far away in the country. Um, the basically the only thing that I have close to my house is the street. Just to, only, you know. Okay, yeah, but thing. but take a look around the outside of your house, like at the foundation level, like at the roof line. Look for cracks and crevices and sources of moisture. And the okay. street is and the street is one. You're right. The street is a possible source of contamination. So um, if you live out in the country, okay, you probably are on a septic system, right? Uh, no, not really. Okay, so you actually you have the city sewer out there? Uh-huh. Okay, because the houses that are out in the country that are on a septic system, you know what? That's a source of contamination if the air isn't moving the right way. Okay. 
I'm not, again, I just, what I'm trying to get you to do is, because as we're doing the design, you're going to be looking at your house a little bit closer. And we want you to be able to identify sources of possible problems. Okay. Um, there's one other thing that I did want to show you guys before we say enough for today. Um, I uploaded, as I said, the ACA Manual D. It's an older version. I'm not allowed to upload the new one um, because of copyright issues. They make money off of this. ACA makes money off of everything. But Appendix 1 in the Manual D that I uploaded has some decent information in it. There's a couple things I wanted to show you very specifically. Remember the chart that I showed you on supply side feet per minute and return side feet per minute? That was for like commercial, residential, apartments and stuff like that. It was another chart that I showed you. Um, the ACA chart actually... Hey, folks, somebody is on, not on mute, and we have some background noise there. Okay, the ACA chart talks much more about, they, want, they narrow these numbers down a little bit, and this chart is actually what a lot of building codes is going down to. So they're basically saying you have two ranges you can use for conservative airflow numbers or maximum airflow numbers, and this is all for noise control. So trunk ducts on the supply side, if you go between 700 and 900, you're fine for noise control. Branch ducts, those are the ones that run to the individual registers, between 600 for rigid and 700 for flex, you're fine for noise control. So again, this is just a chart that narrows it down a little bit. The reason for flex number being a little bit higher is flex duct does absorb noise. Okay, metal duct it has a tendency to echo in, but flex absorbs that noise a little bit. So that's one chart. Now, someone the, someone the other day asked me about um, what can you do to eliminate the closed door effect. You remember I mentioned the closed door effect where you have a supply duct in every room, people at night close the doors, and you don't get enough air back to the return ducts, and things will eventually... Um, the pressures will get too high in the rooms that eventually those rooms are going to get too hot or too cold depending on season. Well, another way you can deal with it, and some builders have done this, but I think it looks ridiculous, is they actually cut the bottom of the door up a certain number of inches from the floor or the top of the carpet to allow air to circulate under the door. Now, again, I'm not a fan of this, and the reason I want to show you this chart is because I want you to basically understand what they're talking about. Okay, if the CFM you need to get out of the room back to the return duct is 300 CFM, okay, and if you have a 36 inch wide door, they have to cut that door up four inches from the carpet or from the floor. Now again, that's ridiculous as far as I'm concerned. So that's why I keep coming back to the, you wanna put a return in every room. But some people have done this by putting a, by trying to cut the door door up a little bit. But again, it's it's just not a good idea. And I'm I'm thinking that I would not want to be in a bedroom with the door cut four inches up over the floor level. So okay, just not a good idea. They actually put a note on there saying adequate door cuts create privacy issues. Okay, and that's again, that's not where I want to be. We talked about um, heating factors and cooling factors. This formula actually comes into play, okay? So heating factor and cooling factor, we'll talk more about this. Don't worry about it right now. Um, sensible heat formula, remember the one that I showed you that was incorrect on that PowerPoint slide because it actually left off the BTUs. It just had like 1.08 times delta T, which is the supply minus the return, okay? They're using the number ACA is using 1.1 rather than going out to two decimal places to 1.08. But you have the two numbers here. You have that formula here. I forget who caught that on the PowerPoint that they actually left off the heating load BTU. But that's what was missing. 
And then the other thing that I want to show you is down in the Appendix 2. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit here to Appendix 2. Remember that duct friction table I was showing you that we've been using for all of our calculations? Okay, it has the inches of duct work. ACA breaks this down further into based on the number of CFMs as well as what the ducts are made out of. In Appendix 2, they have two different, they have tables for all the different types of duct work. Okay, and again, I put this into your handouts. This is one of these things. I know I say it probably quite a lot, but this is one of these things I probably would download and save someplace. If you do a good Google search, you can find it in the future, but it's, I gave it to you here rather than having you guys do the Google search. So, and again, our chart had the um, friction loss on the left side and the CFMs across the bottom. They do the CFMs on the left side. It's the same thing, but they break it down again for by material and CFMs. Okay, does anybody have any questions on anything we went over today? Because I've done, by, I've done what I wanted to cover today. Tomorrow we're going into the design and into the blueprint reading book. Please start reading chapters one through three. It's important. And the material will open later this afternoon. Any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, um, you guys have a great afternoon and be safe.